Thanks for coming. This is uh, uh, ML AI 223 Customer Stories, Transforming Businesses with Cloud AI Solutions. Uh, so today we're going to hear from several, three as a matter of fact, Google Cloud customers about their own stories transforming their businesses using uh, AI and ML technologies on Google Cloud. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> the speakers today are going to uh, uh, come from three different customers. We're going to start with uh, hearing from uh, Minori Matsua, Matsuda from Nissan. Uh, then we're going to hear from Laura Bandura uh, at Chevron. And finally, from Justin Hobson uh, from Hitachi Consulting. <clears throat> Uh, and um, at the end of the session, there should hopefully be a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, there is a dory for this session, as there have been for uh, many of the other breakouts. So if you go to this link, you will be able to at ask questions to the presenters that we will, uh, if we don't get to them uh, at the end of the session, we will make sure to answer them in the dory uh, by the end of the conference. <clears throat> so I'm going to spend just a few minutes recapping some of the things that you heard this morning at the keynote from Rajan Smith, the PM for Cloud AI, uh, about Cloud AI solutions. We've announced several new Cloud AI solutions uh, here at Next. Uh, the idea behind these uh, solutions is uh, to combine the Google AI expertise and the products that you're already familiar with, uh, with an ecosystem of partner services and partner technology services um, to enable the deployment of end-to-end -end AI solutions that utilize your data, uh, but that you can plug into your existing technology and workflows to solve uh, an end-to-end -end business problem. So let's, um, let's dig in a little deeper. Again, um, the, these solutions are targeted towards all of the verticals that you see here, um, <clears throat> including retail and manufacturing, healthcare, media and entertainment, and so on. Um, and uh, the focus is on not just building a machine learning model to do predictions for a particular use case, but rather building an end-to-end -end solution that takes the data in, uh, pre-processes the data, runs it through a model, and then serves those results out to an end application that uh, you, your team may uh, integrate with to, again, solve a real business problem. Uh, so one of the, the key new announcements we've made here next for a uh, cloud AI solution is the new document understanding AI. Uh, again, a um, comprehensive solution targeted on document understanding, uh, many different kinds of documents. You allow, allow you to extract insights from these documents, and it's basically a, a core building block for what could be an end-to-end -end solution for document management, uh, document control, and so on in your business. Uh, we also announced uh, here at Next Recommendations AI which is a state-of-the-art AI service that allows retail customers to power recommendations. Uh, it's a fully managed service. It's very easy to upload your data uh, to, to this service to, to do the integration. And then you can deliver those recommendations to any endpoint. Uh, so you could integrate them with your existing website, for example. Uh, and we've seen uh, dramatic results from our initial deployments uh, over the past year or year and a half. Uh, with several customers in the retail space, including uh, eye-dropping numbers like 90% uh, lift in click-through rates and 40% lift in conversions, uh, and so, in some cases, big lifts in revenue as well. Um, and then, uh, finally, I, I want to mention the Contact Center AI. This was actually announced at the last Next, but uh, we've uh, continued to expand and build on this solution. And it's a great example, again, of uh, a suite of technologies that's all oriented towards solving a particular business problem, namely enabling an AI-powered contact center, or taking your existing contact center and injecting it with AI capabilities. Uh, so again, this is all part of a uh, very comprehensive set of uh, tools and building blocks uh, that we have now in Cloud AI, including many of the other announcements we made it here at, at Next, including things like AutoML tables, something that I'm extremely excited about. Uh, and uh, AI, actually this is a AI platform now, I think a, the name was changed just before the, the conference. Um, as well as all of the hardware acceleration and the frameworks that we support, TensorFlow obviously, but other uh, uh, common frameworks for machine learning, including Scikit-Learn, Spark, and PyTorch. Uh, as well as a growing ecosystem of machine learning partners 
that can help you build your solution. Uh, you can work with Google uh, to, to de deploy the solution, or in many cases, Google plus a partner and yourselves will uh, <coughs> build the solution together. And again, we have an, a, a very large and growing set of uh, solution partners to help you on this journey. All right, with that, I'm going to introduce our first customer speaker. This is Minori Matsuda, data scientist at Nitsen. Minori, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, I, today I talk about the recommendation system on the built on GCP. First of all, my, I'm Minori, and uh, data scientist at the Seven and the High Holdings, and uh, mainly I'm doing the machine learning. And uh, let me introduce the, my company and our group. Our group is the, one of the biggest retail in Japan, and uh, it's based on the mail marketing originally. And uh, we are covering most of household data in Japan. It's uh, over 30 million household data in Japan. And uh, we are mainly retailing the fashion items. This is our company. And uh, talking our data, we are processing the natural language and the product images and the customer attribution data and the customer behavior log, such as the product description and the customer review, the natural language processing. These are mainly Japanese. And the one million plus images and over 30 million households, as I said. And uh, of course, we are retailing on the website. So we have a website catalog and find many transaction data. Okay, and uh, now we have uh, three challenges uh, we had before we used the Google Cloud. One is the need to create a model from scratch. So we have uh, many data, so leverage unique product features from the data. And uh, second is the agile modeling speed. Uh, we issue the five times per year the, the paper catalog. So we do in the modeling by Two over 200 values and uh, making a model, but uh, it's really slow to adapt to the website business speed. And uh, number three is the interoperability of the model. And most of algorithm and uh, most of the software package is the black box inside, so I cannot feedback to the business side the explainable model and the, the service needed to launch within a few months. That's overview. This is the, one of the example of the image similarity based item recommendation. So technically, feature extracted by convolutional neural network and the, doing the unsupervised learning by TensorFlow, the machine will find uh, the left side that dress and the right side dress is a similar product. The machine can recognize it. And uh, I will show a little bit interesting video about this, how the machine recognizes uh, images. I brought the 10,000 product images on this uh, TensorBoard. TensorBoard is a visualization tool of uh, <coughs> TensorFlow. And uh, as you can see, there are many, many products. And I give the task to the machine to clustering. Clustering, so this is the unsupervised learning. And uh, I don't tell the machine that this one is a bed and this one is a shoes. I do not tell to the machine, but machine automatically can classify like this. This is uh, called the dimension reduction. Originally, the, the, this, each point has the 300 dimensional vectors. But after that, the machine can recognize the classification. This is the sweater. This is the bed. That is the bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like this. And also, the machine can understand, the, uh, as you may know, the languages, natural language, such as the word and the document. And the, of uh, same, same as before, the 
giving a task for unsupervised learning of the natural language, the machine will tell the lumbago and the posture is the similar languages. And, oh, it's a corrupting. Okay, uh, by the ensembling the data, ensembling data, this one is hard, hard to see, but uh, we are ensembling the two algorithms such as the structured data and the unstructured data, and uh, such as DNA and the CNN. And uh, what we get from deep learning is the machine finds product affinity by itself, and the machine can product predict before selling and overcome the code start problem, such as the, if the customer has no data, we cannot recommend anything, but we overcome the code start problem. And uh, finally, uh, this is a beyond human understanding. Uh, if we teach to the machine, this is the cute. Ka kawaii is the cute in Jap Japanese, the kawaii. We tell the, what is the Kawaii, what is the cuteness to the machine? The machine will understand the understand the machine will capture the what is the cute the feature of the cuteness. And after machine learn the cuteness, as you can see, the machine generate the cute human woman underwear. And this one, this product does not exist in Liao, and the machine generated, and we are going to sell it in Liao. Then the to competi com competition to the against the human pro product manager. Okay, then thank you very much. Thank you, Minari. All right, next we have um, from Chevron, Laura Bandura. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Bandura, and I'm a research geophysicist at Chevron. In the oil and gas industry, we have so much data, legacy, modern data. It's sequestered across clouds, um, tapes, inter multiple internal file systems, and in some cases, even on paper. The, if we cannot rapidly unearth this information, then the value of this information is reduced significantly. The large projects that we work on tend to be very large and very cross-functional. Cross They're very global. And they require a large diversity of people with different technical expertise, um, different languages, and we, all, and we all work together to attempt to bring value with all, with uh, all of this diversity in mind. And this helps us ultimately to make better decisions. So just as one would use Google Earth to explore the subsurface, into it, to, to explore the subsurface and to organize information on the surface of the Earth, we really aim to want to expand this into an additional dimension in time and in depth. And this is where we utilize our information. And we often work at multiple time scales where we have the age of the rocks. Whoops, can I go back? Where we have the age of the rocks, which is the largest time scale that we work at. And even at a much smaller time scale, we have the asset lifetime, which can range from decades to even a, even a century in some cases. At the, much, at the, most, at the smallest scales, then we're looking at um, our business processes in real time and monitoring business operations around the world. But most importantly, we need to access informa information related to all, access, access all aspects of our business, both quickly and efficiently. So now I'd like to introduce you to Anne, a, a petrophysicist in our San Joaquin Valley Business Unit. It is home to some of the largest oil fields in the world. Um, for example, Midway Sunset Oil Field is the third largest in the United States and the largest in California. 
it has about 35,000 wells. Now, each one of those wells has a paper well file where critical information about the well is stored. And those can range from being like fairly small sized stacks of paper. Um, you can go through some of these uh, pretty quickly um, to just enormous monsters full of analysis and data. Now, I don't usually have to go through the paper files anymore because most of them have been scanned. So I go through the PDFs by hand. Most of the time, if I know data is already there, I can go and find it. Um, and then when I find something really important, I print it. But I also stumble across really interesting things. This is a file from, this is a copy of a record of all of the rocks that were drilled through from a well from 1911. And this is a really snarky letter that somebody wrote about their samples being mistreated. Usually when I find something that I'm going to actually need, I print it. And this is a real stack that I'm working with. Um, and this is fine. So as Anne suggested, we have an opportunity to improve on how we access legacy data and documents to support our decisions now. So now let's take a look at how we have addressed this challenge with tools on GCP. In order to, do, in order to dig deeper into the content of our documents, we first need to break them down into the parts that can be analyzed in a custom way. This requires each document to be segmented and then these segments are classified into either text tables or images. And then we have to order them in order to holistically put them into context. When a document is classified as an image, such as this one, it's important to extract the labels that are within the image, as well as the details within the image. So in this case, we have a geologic model. For some applications, it's important for us to understand those pieces as well as the whole image itself. It's also important that we capture the information within tables and to transform these tables, which in documents are in an, uh, are in an unstructured data format, we want to make, we want to put these into a structured data format so that they can be used by our analysis tools in a much more efficient way. Our documents contain a variety of image types that are specific to the geosciences, many of which that you can see here. These range from seismic data to, to earth models to geologic maps and much more. Some of you may remember from Next, Next 18 that we use AutoML Vision to classify these images. With AutoML, it's straightforward to customize the, classif the classification scheme to our Earth model content, or Earth science content. We simply upload hundreds of images that we have on our, and, and then we upload hundreds of images, and then we label them with some of the, Im the image labels that you see here. And then within a matter of minutes, we can already have an initial model that can help us train um, our, all of our, uh, train our model to classify everything that we have on our system. And then this can be used to make that content searchable um, further. The AutoML interface is very easy to use. There are um, very simple um, tools that are shown to the user, such as the auto, AutoML generated confusion matrix right here. This is a very straightforward way that an, an expert in the geosciences can understand where maybe they may need to add more training examples to improve the model or make other changes to, to increase the accuracy. And in some cases, maybe they just need to train the model longer in order to get a better result. But th these types of outputs are very easy for, for just normal subject matter experts in subjects other than machine learning, so technical experts to use. And that's what we find very useful about AutoML. So, as you can see from the diagram here, AutoML is not all that we needed in order to make this work, to make everything searchable. So I'm going to call up Kenton Prindle to talk about this in more detail. And for the last couple of years, we've had a great partnership with Google, and he has helped us implement this within our company 
and take it away, Kenton. Thank you, Laura. Um, oh, yes, thank you. So yes, as Laura mentioned, we've been uh, working together for quite a while now on, on um, how to characterize these documents at a meta level and then also at a segment level. Um, so as you can see on the left-hand side, um, oh, first to mention that, um, of course, this was last year's information that we basically built um, with, with Chevron. And essentially, we're moving past that quite aggressively now to sub-image segmentation, which you mentioned before, but also well logs, LAS files, and SegWi files. Um, and our focus here is to actually connect it all together for true analog search. And so what we're after is, is stuff that we can get greater and greater and deeper insights into the world's data set, not just data assets data set. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that the ingestion process is just simply just triggered by emptying um, your files into a bucket, and the bucket triggers a whole series of uh, events that automatically process the data. Um, <clears throat> so it goes to GCS storage. Uh, PubSub handles all these events um, and moves to Cloud Dataflow. Dataflow is only tasked with one purpose, which is to break it into pages. The pages then can be parallelized um, for processing in the segmentation space, right? So we go into the page, we segment the page as a human readable flow, right? So we, we keep all the text, we keep all the images in the right order so that it was as if a human was reading the document. Later in life, this will become evident of why. <laughs> it takes a long time to do this, but we want not only the semantic expressions of how the document and information flows, we want sentiment. And sentiment is very, very hard to achieve without keeping the word flow of the entire uh, vector space consistent. So we're doing this for some reason later, which, which we'll talk about. Um, and then, of course, once we get this information on the segment level, we're actually passing it through um, a whole series of APIs. Um, so these APIs are, of course, Auto ML Vision, NLP, um, and translation, amongst a few others. And the whole point here is we're, we're trying to figure out with, with every one of these holes, whether they're an image, a table, an equation, um, a drilling diagram, a table, whatever it is, uh, text. And, and so once we get this, we actually run that you know, adaptively through the algorithm to figure out the information we want off of it. Once we do that, we actually pass that into a, um, a cloud machine learning engine called to figure out uh, a word to vec and image to vec encoded uh, dual, dual model, right? And so in this case, we're trying to figure out what the type of the document is. So we're not stopping it, just getting the information out for just general keyword search. We're trying then to go deeper and say, well, this is a drilling report, or this is a composite log. Whatever it is, we're trying to make it easy so you can do filter search as well as just true vector search. Um, <clears throat> from that point, PubSub delivers that back to the GCF, GS, GCS archive and all of the segments of interest are saved there for display. Um, and then, uh, of course, we index those either to Cloud Search or Elasticsearch. Um, Cloud Search is our preferred method because we can scale much more, but Elasticsearch works perfect as well. And then, um, of course, we've integrated dialogue flow so that you can talk to your, your uh, interface. Um, but that's not a big focus of this. Ultimately, what we end up with is the documents on a map with the ability to search images or text or images and text. All right, so why are we doing all this? We're not just doing it to um, pull out the images and pull out this information. We're trying to integrate all the data, right? And so on the top, you'll see that we have classic kind of digital data that we experience a lot. We see well logs and seismic, um, earth models. Um, these things are reasonably well formatted and understood. Um, and then we're trying to take the glue between those and the interpretation are the documents, right? They are the true interpretations that we're actually getting from these upper, upper images. So what we've done recently um, with Chevron is we've built a knowledge graph that, that can handle the, uh, the entity resolution um, and geolocate based on that resolution. So at this point, we've got LAS curves, we've got SegWi files, um, we've got any kind of attribute of any of those, those feature sets, and we've got the documents tied to those features in a connected similarity and edge um, 3D space, such as this. So you'll see here on the left, we have this well log and seismic. It's pretty obvious when you do this as a geophysicist that this well log belongs to this piece of seismic. Um, that's the classic kind of view of this. But when you don't actually have this stuck into a project, it's actually quite hard to understand where this data is connected. So on the right-hand top, you'll see the knowledge graph representation of this. And you'll see that we have nice, nice knowledge graph nodes connecting who, would this, who is the operator. What, what did this log and or uh, field from the document? Was it an oil producing field? Was it the Scott field? And the point here is now when you search for these things, you're getting back the analog system, not just the data that you're looking for. We get all the features that belong to that particular search term if you're looking for a finite object. But then if you look for a general object like 
a, a porous sandstone of Northwest Shelf Australia, for example, you actually might light up a world map and say, here are all the Triassic sands that actually have relevant features that are similar to this. And that, that's kind of our goal in this space. Back to Laura. All right, so we real, this is really just the beginning for us. We started from an earth science proof of concept where we applied these methods to exploration, asset development, and operations. But now we are really on a journey to embracing the opportunity for impact across our entire enterprise where we can move to onto um, drilling completions, facilities, and health, environment, and safety. So we see so much hope for this application, and we're looking forward to expanding it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura and Kenton. Our next and final speaker is Justin Thompson from Hitachi. I'm oh, sorry, Hobson. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Lockman. <clears throat> As it says here, I'm Justin Hobson. I'm a senior data scientist with Hitachi's consulting division. We're the professional services arm. and um, I want to talk to you today about a customer story. This is something that might be relevant to some of you in the room. For others, you may not be as familiar with this background. We're going to talk about decent uh, damage from the recent electric utility fires here in California. There have been uh, impacts here. We've had uh, human fatalities. We've had uh, liability, litigation. This is something very important to our community. And we saw this as an opportunity to get involved and understand what are the historical patterns that have led to utility-caused fires. In particular, we're going to focus on the electrical grid and what were the conditions that exist prior to fire ignition and see if we can model where will those conditions occur again in the future. So, That'll be the first part of this talk. I want to go through some of the data, the training and the validation, some of the mapping and the output, and then more importantly, can we actually turn it into action? It's great to have the insight, but can you actually go do something with it to change people's lives, change operational behavior out in the field? So I know I've got many different people in the audience. Some of you want to understand how did you do it? So let's start at the architecture and work our way up. So here on the left, some obvious candidates. We've got some batch data. Had to look at long-term risk factors. Things like drought, obvious contributor to flammability. Had to look at the electrical utility assets, parts of the transmission and the distribution grid. What's their age? What's their condition? What's been the maintenance on those assets? Had to look at the historical weather. Where was it windy? Right? Where were there, uh, when was it wet and raining? And then, of course, uh, what we're trying to predict, fires. And then we also got to work with some streaming data uh, using PubSub in particular. We had the uh, utility management activity. Right? The, the electrical grid, while it's been around for over 100 years in some locations, we're constantly doing work on it. We're changing the quality. We're doing maintenance. We're doing repairs. And so I want that information as soon as we can get it. Also, we've got vegetation management activity that happens every single day. We've got crews out trimming trees, looking uh, at the condition in the right-of-way, looking at the condition adjacent to the right-of-way. And then last, I've got the weather forecast, because I want to know what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after that and the week after that. So we could ingest all of that. Obviously, we'd have uh, a tremendous uh, amount of time series processing we had to do. Spun up data proc was great for that. We were storing results, uh, both base data and process data, in cloud storage. And then we had a couple different approaches to our modeling that evolved over time. Uh, we had the cloud ML engine, where we're running uh, some of our models. And then also, we just used the cloud data lab. It was great for just getting quick answers. And then we would read all that out into a front end, because uh, uh, as a data scientist, I was really happy back here. But for my business users, I needed to publish and it was great that I could put results into Cloud SQL, because then they could feed it into all kinds of downstream uh, applications. 
and then I could put a web UI on the front, right? I didn't know who all the users might be, but I knew that I could make it available to them on the Google Cloud platform. This for us was very much a journey of discovery. We did not sit down in a conference room and say, based on everything we know, let's architect this thing once, and I'm sure we're going to get it right. And I think you may have heard some of that in what Kenton talked about as well. So a couple things we learned I wanted to share with you, because you may go on a similar journey. One on the left, the architecture. We sat down with the initial design. Our feeling was, this is probably a good start. We got started, and we learned we didn't nail it the first time. But there are some great tools out there, in particular, the official icons and the sample diagrams what was great as we could bring in subject matter experts and talk about the problem, talk about the data, talk about the challenges we had and some of the ETL processes and say, does this feel like something that's been solved before? Does Google already have tools and accelerators that we could use? And the answer was yes. Also on the pricing, I'm in a professional services organization. People always ask me, how long is it going to take? What's it going to cost? And so uh, some of the pricing wasn't known, right? The answer is, well, it depends how fast you want to go. How soon do you want it? So we had some great, uh, we used the pricing calculators. That worked really well, because I could then put that back into my client's hand and say, it's your decision. The tools are here. They will support you to do it. It's really what's your budget and what's your demand in the market. <clears throat> also, the inexperience with the new tools. The Google Cloud platform continues to evolve. You saw today, we've got new tools available to us. There's also been an evolution of the tools we were using while we were using them. And that worked really well, but it meant we weren't always experienced. So I could take junior folks uh, and get them involved, build on what they already knew, and then get them deeper into the Google Cloud ecosystem. So that was really great for building morale in the team and sustaining the energy on this pro uh, project. We also dealt a lot with the complexity in building the data science pipelines. There's a lot of math. It's complex. But what I found is I could tell people, just go try it. Just get started. I could put the tools in their hands and it worked really well. They could do prototyping. They could get into sheets. We could say, here's what I want to do. Now I want to do it even bigger. I'm kind of excited about the uh, auto ML work and some of the connected sheet stuff we saw today. I might be using that uh, by next week. Um, and then the other thing is, because I had a smaller, very high trust team, it was great for me. I had great visibility. And my whole team had visibility to each other's work. And so that made it very efficient. If somebody was out or they had a question how it was done, I could always get to the repository. I could see the work. I could see the workflow. And if my leadership wanted to audit and understand or my client wanted to dig deeper, it's all there for them to see. It's transparent. And then the last part, uh, the DevOps basics. This stuff will kill you if you don't think about it. it it's a lot harder. If you did it the old way, <laughs> it took a lot of time and money. So I was very excited. Um, we felt that natively building these applications in GCP cut out a lot of time and cost. Uh, for those of you who like the pretty pictures, uh, here's an example on your left of one of our early models. You can see uh, some of the utility footprint. You can see some of the trees. Some of the risk factors are modeled out in the grid. And that was great. We got an answer. But of course, the very, that very day we read out the results, we've got it. I think we've got it. I got asked, well, hey, this is great. Can, can we expand the spatial scope? Can, can we build out to adjacent states? Can we go to other utilities and territories? Because you know we trade power with them. And if they go down, I go down. We got asked for expanded temporal scope. Can you take more time? How about, could we add more variables? Oh, I've got a really great idea. I met somebody who's in forestry, and he was explaining to me the physics and how the different species of trees have different elasticities in the wind. I'm like, hey, yes. We're on a platform where we can do that. Really, what we're left with are our business priorities. Which one do you want to bite off first? It allowed us to run lots of model variants as well to explore to the extent the research was not clear and there were opportunities for us 
to work and expand on some of the research that the universities had done. Uh, we were able to do that. And ultimately, I, I'm a business person. Could we make it actionable? Could we make it easier for the downstream applications to consume this information and change the work orders that go out tomorrow to actually make a difference out in the world? The other piece of this was really interesting. If you come at it from a policy perspective, right? So we put together the model and everybody, you know, let's talk about the accuracy and the precision and the recall. And let, let's, let's get into the numbers. And, and that's, of course, important. Obviously, along the diagonal here, the true positives, right? The ones we got right. Also important, the true negatives. We predicted no fire, there was no fire. But let's talk about the off diagonal. This is a really interesting policy discussion. In the bottom left corner, we predicted there would be a fire. But in fact, there wasn't any. So what's the harm? What have we done when we're wrong in this model? I've sent somebody out to trim trees. Well, the utility's obligated to go through the whole territory every year, every two years, every four years. It depends on the risk and where you are, what the utility, what the regulation is in your state. But really, I've maybe accelerated when we got to it but nobody's been harmed. So it's relatively low cost for something I was going to do operationally anyway. The top right is the one you don't want to be wrong. That's where we said, ah, I, don't, I don't think that's the dangerous one, but it turns out it was. So when we got into all the hyperparameter tuning, that's the one where you said, I got to make that thing as small as possible. Every data set you can give me, every transformation you can think of, and I was never limited by the platform. I'm limited by our imagination, by the research, and by time. Some examples then, uh, we also found it was helpful, you know, got great big data sets and want to know, so where were we right? Where were we wrong? Two examples up here, false positives. These are actually kind of a fun story. I was wrong because we got there early. I told you 12 hours before it failed, I thought it was going to fail. So in my mind, that's actually a success story. I was, I was wrong, but the impact of that is you would have cut it down and we'd all be a lot happier. And on the right-hand side, some that we got right. Not only the location and the time, we understood the conditions. And that made us feel like we've got this. This is good enough that we can start to operationalize, we can roll it out, we can make decisions with this data, with this model, with this team. So, a couple takeaways. First, we really had a great experience with the Google Cloud platform. It's an ecosystem. It's scaled for us. It allowed us to integrate, and it allowed our product development team to get out and come up with new ideas, and, and I never had to tell them, eh, technology doesn't do that. We could say, yeah, we can do that. And the second part is, there are a lot of ways to get there. Right? I, I showed you one of the architectures that we implemented on this journey. Uh, but it's, I would encourage you to experiment. It's easy to set up, it's easy to run through it, and it's easy to tear down and try something different. Think of it as a journey, and think of it as one that's actually kind of fun to go on. Uh, the other piece is, uh, for me personally, that efficiency and the accuracy, that was so important. My feeling, I could get my team motivated every single day and say, today, we're gonna make it better. We're going to build on everything we had, and it was all there, and we had a way to share those learnings with each other. Once so. again, thank you very much uh, for uh, attending this session, and thank you again to all of our presenters from Chevron, Hitachi, and Nissan. Thank you.